and it will all be about good practices. Good practice is very important and it's very much neglected in, uh, in education, in, uh, in GIS and, and data uh, related uh, topics. So the objectives of this uh, lecture are that after this lecture, you'll be able to recognize different file formats that are used in GIS, describe advantages and disadvantages of the different file formats, and apply these good practices that you will learn with sharing the different uh, file formats. But let me put one thing uh, at first, which is very important. The best way to share your data is through a spatial data infrastructure and not through files. The, most of this, this presentation will be about files, but just keep in mind that, uh, well, you are lucky to have the SADC uh, um, uh, GIP uh, portal where you can share the data, but often still you need to share your files and uh, that can be because you don't have internet connection or you can't access the portals uh, that are existing, but please keep in mind this is the best way because it enables you to share and access uh, easily uh, geospatial data and it's more than just a database and you will learn that in the last session um, of this uh, this training uh, it's about discovering data sets finding it we will play with these uh, portals already today it's like a search engine where you put your questions and you will get uh, the results and before downloading you can visualize the data in interactive uh, maps maybe infographics or real-time uh, data in the form of graphs you can also evaluate the data before downloading. You can look at the metadata, which is very important uh, because based on that metadata, you judge if the data is useful for you or not. And if the quality that you need is, is there. And finally, it will give you access, but not only by downloading the files, as you will also see today, but also directly uh, loading the layers into your GIS but also in um, other websites or in apps and services that you can make. So a whole world opens up when you have your data in an SDI instead of in a file system. Having said that, uh, we found it very useful to have these good practices for sharing groundwater geospatial data document for you that was developed during this uh, project. And uh, this presentation is basically a summary with some illustrations of uh, what is in this, uh, in this uh, good practices document. Very important, I would say, because well, if you work with GIS, with spatial data, with SDI, then a lot of these words that I put here in the word cloud come up and it's, uh, well, as this word cloud shows, it's complicated. There's a lot of things. It's about files, it's about databases, there are styles, there are layers, there's rasters, there's vectors, um, there's open data, there are licenses, so there are many different things to take care of. And, Above all, there's also a different software to deal with it and a lot of confusion and fake news can happen if you don't know what you're talking about. So therefore, in this presentation, we want to clarify uh, certain things about uh, data files and, um, and software. So why is all this confusion happening? That's because uh, there are many different GIS file formats and these formats are created by government mapping agencies they'll find the need to develop uh, their own um, formats, especially in the past when there was uh, less standardization. Um, but also GIS software tools, they all tend to have their own formats and some really like to lock you into their formats. So the formats can only be used in their software and not anywhere else. Um, so therefore we now have this uh, huge amount of different file formats. And all these different files, they also have different uh, usages. And it's very important that you uh, can distinguish between the different usages of these files. So for desktop GIS applications, you can focus in this presentation on five different types of files. There's vector data files, there's raster data files. There are files where we store the styling of the layers. There are spatial databases. They can, there can be files, spatial databases stored in a file in your uh, file system, or they can be uh, on the network, like in your SDI. And there are project files where you save your project while you're working on it. In this uh, lecture, I will go through all these different types with uh, examples. So one of the main objectives here is that you can recognize different file types 
And you do that by looking at the, the metadata and SDI provides that, but if you share data with another person, it's uh, important that you add uh, some files with it explaining what they are looking at. It can be a simple text file, it can be a spreadsheet, it can be a whole document, but um, this is often missing when you get data, this uh, metadata. And then the only thing you can look at is the file extension and then determine based on that what you can do with, uh, with the file and in which software you can read it. So um, the best practice is to add metadata when you're sharing or ask for that metadata when you get uh, data from others. And often still it is the case that you have to look at the file extension and uh, determine yourself what to do with it. Now files are something complicated, especially nowadays when you click and swipe in tools, but in the past we really had to, uh, and still programmers uh, like me also have to do that. We have to look at uh, the paths of the files and they are built up uh, in a certain way. It gives us on which disk it's stored. Then we add the root, we add the folder. Uh, the, in the past they were called directories and Windows terminology it's called folders. There can be several folders and then we have the file name and these file names have an extension. Basically it looks like this, the hard disk D with the root, the data folder and we have a file wells.shp, which is uh, we can recognize later uh, as a shape file. And it will look like in our uh, file system uh, written like this. So D column, then a backslash on Windows and DOS systems, data for the name of the folder, another backslash, and then the name of the file wells and the extension .shp. That's called the file extension. It's like a first name and a surname. The first name is Wells and the surname is SHP. And with the surname, the extension, we can uh, know to which family of files it belongs. And in this case, to the shape file. Now in Windows, uh, you can uh, switch on. You see it here in the animations that now some extensions are missing. That's how Windows does it default. If you go to the view menu, you can switch on the file name extensions. And now certainly you can find uh, what kind of different file extensions uh, they are used. If you click that button in the file explorer, it will also print the path uh, in the way that I explained here on this slide. So that's very useful to know that you can do that with your uh, file explorer. Now, because of all these different file formats, we can um, luckily since some decades easily convert many of these formats because there is something uh, that is called GDAL or GUDAL, depending on uh, where you live, how to pronunciate it. And it stands for the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. And it has a website, gdal.org. It's an open source tool and it supports many raster and vector formats. And it comes with uh, tools to uh, do conversions. And you might not know this, but uh, this GDAL library is used in uh, all the common GIS software that uh, you might be using such as QGIS, ArcGIS, but also Google Earth and other ones. And here on the right, uh, on the slide, you see um, different tools that you can also use as standalone uh, from the, um, the GDAL installation that also comes with QGIS and to do all these things by uh, scripting, which makes it much faster than pushing buttons. So if you feel that you're at that level, um, then certainly I can recommend to uh, follow the uh, free course that I have on the IHE Delft open course where on uh, scripting where you learn uh, working with DOS, with command line, and uh, using the, the GDAL functions that you see here to do uh, translations of files and to do reprojections uh, using the command line. And that's very useful if you get a model output, like you groundwater people uh, get a lot from your models, and you need to convert 100 files to another format and another projection then with a few lines of code, you can solve that. So if you are at that level of learning, then uh, this would make your life much easier to learn this skill. Now let's go to the different formats. First, I will discuss the vector format. And uh, there will be some uh, repetition in what you learned earlier, but vector, as you, you might know, uh, are point data, such as boreholes data sets, line data, for example, folds, in your geology, or polygon data, for example, aquifers. These are three types of vector data that we have. And vector data uh, consists of features 
objects at the Earth's surface. And they can be split up into their attributes that basically gives the information related to the feature and the geometry. And the geometry is uh, the spatial information. So it can be an X, Y coordinate for a point, sometimes a Z or other uh, attributes. Polylines, where there are multiple points that are connected, or polygons, where we have uh, three or more points, uh, where the last point is also connected to the first point. We call these points, of course, of course nodes. So a feature has attributes containing information, which is in the attribute table, and it has geometry, points, lines, or polygons uh, for uh, the geographic information. So vector data represents real world features in a GIS environment, and it can be anything that you see in the, in the landscape, like on this picture, where we can see a river, we can represent it with a line. Uh, we can have a road, which is a line. We can have buildings, and if we group them, it will be a city or a village or a, a building block. And this can be a polygon, but also the individual buildings can be polygons. Um, in the same way, you can have your boreholes and wells as points and pipelines as uh, lines, obviously, and aquifers as uh, polygons. And related to that, we have attributes. This can be text or numerical information in the attribute table that gives information about the uh, different uh, objects that we see. That's typical for uh, vector data. Vector data have some common problems that you need to solve before using it. First of all, the accuracy uh, of the vectors depend on which scale they are digitized. And this picture on the left has been digitized on a one to one million map. But when we plot it over a satellite image, we can see that the accuracy is not very high because on the one to one million map, these borders are not very uh, accurate. They are more generalized. Now, if we would digitize it from a one to 50,000 map, we can get a really more accurate uh, boundary, even the island here. And if we then plot it on top of a satellite image, it will show us that we are more close to, to the reality. So take that into account. The resolution of digitizing of your background map determines the quality of your uh, vector data. Another problem with uh, vector data are slivers. This looks uh, correct, but if we zoom in to this polygon, we see that there's a, some distance between these two polygons, which probably not meant to be there. And this gap, of course, means that something else should be in between, but probably these two polygons need to be connected and that needs to be corrected before you can use uh, the vector data. It's called uh, slivers. And the solution for these kind of problems is when you digitize that you switch on the snapping function. So when you digitize a second polygon, it will snap to the nodes that are here uh, from the other polygon. And then you avoid these kind of gaps in between. Similar problem can happen with lines. So if you deal with pipelines, for example, you can have overshoots and undershoots. And that's quite problematic because if we look at this example one where we have an undershoot, it will never connect to the main line. And uh, then our routing of the water through the pipeline will go uh, wrong. And Another problem at number two is where we have an overshoot. This line should connect to the main line, but it goes over. So this will also give wrong results because it looks like there's a dangling uh, line here, which, which should not be there. Also, these problems can be solved during digitizing uh, by snapping to the main line. If you receive such a layer, uh, you need to do some topological uh, corrections. Uh, there's some uh, information on the internet on how to do that. It's quite a job, so better prevent it while making the layer. Just a bit of background about what a shapefile uh, is or what a vector file is um, as a re reminder. And one of the ways to store that is the SV shapefile. An SV shapefile is not one file. It's a very misleading uh, name. The shapefile, in fact, comes with three mandatory files with the following extensions. There's the .shp file, which is basically the shape format. It has the feature geometry that uh, is needed to, to plot it on, uh, in a GIS. Then there's the .shx format, which is an index 
that uh, relates uh, the geometry to positions and to make it easy to, to search uh, in a spatial way. And there's the .dbf file, which is uh, the dbase4 format. You can read it in a, in a spreadsheet program, program such as uh, LibreOffice or in, uh, in Excel. And um, basically a spreadsheet containing uh, the attribute information in, in the columns. Now you really need to have these three files together to read the shapefile. So if you only share the .shp, it will not work. But often it comes with other extensions. So if you see file names with, uh, which are the same as the .shp, uh, but they have other extensions that are not the three mandatory ones, then other important ones are the .prj, which includes the projection of the file. So don't throw that one away. Uh, when you share it, because that is a very important one and the GIS uh, desktop programs read that file to uh, interpret the uh, projection. And there's the .cpg uh, file. And that is very important for uh, the ones of you who uh, work in countries that uh, have languages with accents. So you need to then know which kind of encoding for the characters you use to get those accents also right in your uh, attribute table. There's information in the report uh, with some examples on, uh, on these uh, character encoding that you can use for Portuguese and, and French, for example. Um, so the most important thing to remember is that you have to copy all the files with uh, the different extensions which belong to the shape file because sharing only the SHP file simply does not work. And then a good practice to, to share these files because they are uh, a bunch of files is to zip them. It will make them smaller, but it will also keep them together. Uh, and here you see in the picture an example for a uh, recharge vector data set as a shape file. And we simply zip all these files into recharge.zip and then share it with others. I can uh, highly recommend to use the 7-zip program because it's open source and free and uh, comes uh, without all kinds of commercials that you get with uh, WinRAR and other software, for example. And you can uh, simply download it at uh, 7-zip.org. Now let's go a bit through the pros and cons of using S3 shapefiles. There are some advantages because it is the most supported GIS vector format uh, at the moment although we see it declining because there are better formats uh, around. But still, it's important for you to know uh, what it is. Uh, it's a proprietary format developed by ESRI from ArcGIS, ArcMap, ArcInfo. Uh, but the specification is open, and therefore we can easily convert to and from the ESRI shapefile format. And for many purposes, it's just good enough. Although it has some limitations, which I'll uh, tell you in a bit, it has a good reading performance and it's efficient in uh, terms of file size. So for many purposes, it's just good enough. But there are some important disadvantages that you need to think about if you design your own data, if you really want to use the S3 shapefile. First of all, it does not include a coordinate reference system definition. You always need to have this extra .prj file. And it's a multi-file format, as we have seen. So it is not one file. And that always gives complications, because when you share, there's always files missing that are essential for you to read the S3 shapefile format. It also has a lot of practical limitations. The attribute names can be maximum 10 characters. If uh, the, the attribute names are longer than 10 characters, it will truncate, which will give also a bit cryptical names. You can also have a maximum of 255 attributes, just that you know it. In most cases, it will be enough, but in some cases, you might need more. It has limited data types, um, like, like float and integers, but it can only hold a maximum of 254 characters in your, um, in your attributes. And uh, that is a problem if you, for example, want to store uh, long links or uh, IDs uh, that we use in, in cadastral maps, for example, uh, then it becomes really problematic. It has a maximum file size of two uh, gigabytes, but um, with some workarounds, you get it uh, up to four uh, gigabytes, uh, but it's still tricky. 
And one of the main problems, uh, which uh, an older format, the, the SV coverage had, uh, is that this one does not have topology checking. So it means that basically it's a drawing which does not check if the data is, uh, uh, is correct or not. And topology has to do with these uh, problems that I've uh, shown you uh, in the previous slide, like slivers and undershoots and overshoots, and, and that things are connected. So you need to really correct that if you want to do analysis with the data. Another disadvantage is that you can have only one geometry per file. So you either have a point vector in a shape file or a line or a polygon. You cannot have multiple geometries in, uh, in one uh, file type. So you cannot have a shape file that contains uh, wells, uh, folds and aquifers. That's not possible. There are many more uh, disadvantages, but these are the most important ones for you to know. And there's a link which is also in the report, uh, switchfromshapefile.org, uh, which gives all these advantages and disadvantages and alternatives that I'll also show you. A very useful one, which is not um, much used for GIS specialists, but more if you want to share with non-GIS specialists, so maybe uh, some of your managers who need to present uh, your data uh, in, in meetings or want to look at it and they don't have a, uh, have a course in, in GIS, then it's easy to share it in the keyhole markup language, the KML format, um, which is the format that uh, Google Earth uses. And if they have Google Earth, which is an easy program, of course, to download freely and to use, and they double click on the file, it will open in, uh, in Google Earth. It's uh, also GDAL supported, so you can export it from uh, GIS or import it. Uh, so if you have a shape file, you can make it into a KML, give it to other people who uh, are not GIS specialists and they will open it in uh, Google Earth. And uh, it's very useful to share it with uh, users without the GIS software, but it only uses the latitude longitude EPSG 4326 projection. Um, so when you convert it, uh, it always has that projection. Even if you indicate another one, it will always assign this one. That's something to keep in mind. Sometimes you also find the .kmz format. That's basically a zipped KML file. And that is when it contains uh, some, uh, a lot of data and to, to get it smaller. And uh, it can store also uh, raster overlays, but uh, mostly it's uh, used for, for vector data to put points, uh, lines, or polygons on the Google map. Another type that you encounter a lot are the CSV files, comma separated values. And uh, there you will see it's basically a text file that you can open in any text editor and you will see that it has uh, the comma as a, uh, as a delimiter, but it's not always uh, the case that it's a comma. So um, I will come on to that on the next uh, slide, but you can easily import or export uh, these files from, uh, from spreadsheet programs, so from Excel or LibreOffice, and you can read them into a GIS. Uh, and that's especially useful if you find like in this example that it has uh, coordinates so that's important. And in QGIS, you do it uh, by uh, using add layer, add delimited text layer, and then you can open these CSV files. Now there's some good practice advice with CSV files too. Always when you get a CSV file, open it in a text editor, use Notepad or any other tool that you use for opening uh, plain text to check if the delimiter is a comma and that's often depending on your uh, language settings. Like on my computer, the language is Dutch and in Dutch we use uh, a comma for decimals. So if I use a comma as a column separator, something will uh, go very wrong. And we use the dots as, uh, as decimal, uh, as a thousand separator. So in our case, when we export it, and that will be the same for uh, many non-English languages like, like French and Portuguese also, I guess, if you export it from Excel, uh, or LibreOffice, then it will uh, know that you are using the comma as a decimal and somehow the software will choose that the, uh, that the delimiter, the column, uh, the column separator will not be a comma, but a semicolon. So it's always useful to open the CSV file in a text editor to verify what the delimiter is. So you can indicate that in the software 
uh, as a GIS, for example, uh, what to use. What's also important if you have it open in a text editor is to look for the coordinate fields and if there's a header. So we'll do that in the exercise today. And CSV files are not GIS files, basically they're just tables and they don't include projection information. Therefore, it is very important to uh, look up the projection uh, that is used in the table. And if you recognize latitude longitude coordinates, they're quite easy to, to recognize. Then uh, if you have to guess, then it's EPSG 4326 that you use. If you see other numbers in X and Y columns, then uh, yeah, you need to get back to the data source and find out or otherwise it's a trial and error. And what's anyways good to do is to, after importing it into your GIS, to check it with a background map. So put an open street map or a satellite image or another reference map that you are sure that it's in the right projection, put it in the background and plot your CSV on top of it uh, to, to check if it's in the right locations. Mistake that's often made is that X and Y are swapped and that your data is somewhere in the ocean. Here you see how it goes in, uh, in QGIS. So um, you can open a CSV file and then here in the file format, you can then indicate what kind of delimiter is used. So default, it will be comma, but uh, you can then change it to tab or semicolon. Then you can select if the first record has the field names and if the decimal separator is a comma. So all these things is a bit contradictory. And here uh, in the geometry, if you find the X and Y coordinates, you can indicate that these are points and which field contains the X. So here longitude and which the Y, the latitude. And you need to indicate then the projection. That's essential if you find the coordinates that you indicate here, the CRS, the coordinate reference system. DMS means uh, degrees, minutes, seconds. So if it is written not in decimal degrees, DD, like here, but in degrees, minutes, and seconds, you need to check that box. Let's move to raster data. A raster basically is uh, also a table. It's a matrix of pixels or cells. And here you see the matrix, and this is a pixel. That's one cell in the matrix which has rows and it has columns. Uh, and these rows and columns are linked to a coordinate system. And the size of the pixel is uh, the spatial resolution. You know, that's what we see here. So we see here the width and there the height. And uh, that's normally we work with uh, square pixels, but they can also have other shapes. Uh, but if it's just square, then we normally say that uh, the spatial resolution is, uh, for example, 30 meters, and then we mean that it's 30 by 30 meters. In raster data, we can only store values. And uh, there are different data types. There are integer values, whole numbers, that we use for discrete or Boolean data. Um, in the last session, you will learn more about Boolean, which is true and false. And discrete is for uh, layers with information about classes like a land use map or a soil map. We can also store floating point data or decimal data, real values, and that's for continuous data like uh, elevation or uh, um, hydraulic head. There's also uh, the no data, which is a specific value that indicates uh, that this data should not be used in the analysis. It has uh, different names in different software. So no data, MV means uh, missing value or none means not a number. Okay, we already talked about vector, but why then do we need raster data? Well, let's look at the same picture again. And raster data is uh, very useful to um, represent continuous information better than a vector. And uh, we have, uh, different gradients that we can see here on the picture. And we can uh, see, for example, the elevation that is changing here. There are some uh, hills and some valleys. Uh, we see gradients in vegetation cover from dense to sparse and also here in the grass cover. Uh, and there are many other things also related to, uh, to geology and to uh, hydrogeology, for example, uh, things that you, you cannot really see, but that you, you will use in, in a study area is uh, precipitation, 
there is uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity and these things are all uh, changing gradually throughout your uh, study area and then rasters are much better than vectors in vector it's almost impossible to represent uh, gradients so different raster types discrete rasters they are most uh, like to uh, they're most comparable to the polygons because they have sharp boundaries and they have integer values that represent classes such as a land use map or a soil map there's continuous rasters they contain real values and features that don't have sharp uh, borders, sharp boundaries, uh, and the gradients that we've been talking about. So you can think of a digital elevation model about temperature, soil moisture, and uh, runoff. And then there's a special type of discrete that are Boolean rasters. It can only store values of one and zero, where one means true and zero means false. So that's what we use a lot in map algebra, like flooded versus non-flooded, polluted, non-polluted, urban, non-urban. This is important information and uh, the, in general, the GIS software doesn't know if the data is discrete, continuous or Boolean, but to visualize it and to use it, you as a user need to know what it is. And it's good practice that you style the layers according to its data type. So if you have discrete rasters in QGIS, you use the palleted unique values renderer to give each unique value in the layer a color. And then you can give it a label. For example, different types of land use. And for Boolean, you only have zero and one, and then you can also use false and true. And in both cases, you use the palleted unique values renderer. If you have continuous rasters, we use the single band pseudo color renderer. There we can use ramps like these ones. Like for elevation, you would use something like this, which goes from blue to, to brown and not the other way around because that's less intuitive. There's a special case which you sometimes use that's in remote sensing where we have multi-band rasters, where the reflection of the surface is stored in different bands. And then your raster layer does not have one layer, but it has multiple layers. And in a GIS, you can choose then a combination of layers to be visualized. So here we combine three different layers in QGIS, and then we can interpret the uh, reflection uh, based on the brightness of different colors and distinguish, for example, urban versus uh, natural areas and agricultural areas. So let's uh, look at some examples of uh, raster data. First, there's the remote sensing data that's continuous because it has reflection values that are uh, real values between zero and one. Digital elevation models, they can be decimal, they can be even negative, like uh, I live here below sea level in the Netherlands, so it will be a negative elevation. Um, and high mountains, of course. It can be used for interpolated data where we have gradients. We'll also do that in uh, the last session to interpolate points. Then some examples for discrete data, for example, a land use map. Here we see the Korean land use map of Europe, where each uh, class is uh, uh, a real, uh, sorry, uh, an integer number in your raster and gets a certain color of the legend. So it can only have um, integer values and no decimals. A land use class of 1.25 does not exist. It's always one, two, three, etc. Same for a soil map, this is the European soil map. And then the special type that's Boolean, where we only have zero and one. Here you see flooded versus non-flooded. So the light green here is flooded and transparent is non-flooded. And here for another flood event, we have the blue, which is flooded and then the zeros are made transparent for non-flooded. So that's what we can do with Boolean maps. Now, how do we store uh, rasters? Uh, the most often used format is the GeoTIFF. TIFF is not specific for GIS. It's also used in uh, storing uh, any type of images that are in raster formats. It stands for the tagged image file format, but it has an extension for GIS and that makes it a GeoTIFF. It's a public domain uh, standard, uh, which can contain georeferencing information, which is embedded in the TIFF which contains the map projection, coordinate systems, ellipsoid and, uh, and datums. 
There's also another type of uh, TIFF that we can use in uh, GIS, and that's the one that has a so-called world file with it. The, if you find a TIFF file with a .tfw, the .tfw is very important if you want to share it because it contains the rotation and the scaling of the file. We call those extra files sidecar files. And uh, if you find the .tfw, the world file, then please share it with uh, other people to uh, use it uh, in a GIS. Another format that we have is uh, the ArcInfo ASCII grid format. Um, it's less and less used, but you will still encounter it. Uh, it has uh, uh, the format also in a human readable text format. Uh, but if you load it in a GIS, you will see it as a normal uh, raster layer with colors for different uh, pixels. And if we look at the text file that is uh, the, the ASCII grid, we can see that it has a header. So these first six lines are the header and it defines how many columns. In this case, there are four columns, one, two, three, four, six rows, one, two, three, four, five, six. It gives the coordinate of the X lower left corner and the Y lower left corner. And it gives here the cell size because the computer really does not care about these things. That is information that you as a user need to provide and the header files are always very important to do that uh, and you need metadata for that. Now, and then we get all the pixel values. Oh, here is a definition of no data. Uh, the no data value here is uh, minus 9999. We use that value often because it's an out of range value. If you would use zero, let's say you have an elevation model in this format, zero can also be zero elevation, zero meters. So it's not so smart to use zero. Uh, with minus 9999, we are quite sure that it's not in the range of elevation values that we would expect. So use an out of range value and an old convention is to simply use minus 9999. And then uh, we get all the values. So no data, no data, five, two. And then here, no data, 20, 136, et cetera. So that's how the ASCII grid works. It's just one file. It can has, have different extensions. So you cannot really recognize it from the extension. Sometimes it's simply .txt, sometimes .grd. It can be anything. But if you open it in a text editor and you see this header, then you are quite sure that it's an ASCII grid and then you can uh, open it as an ASCII grid in your GIS format. Another um, thing that you will encounter are spatial databases. And spatial databases are uh, in fact the best means to store spatial data because it is not limited to just raster or just vector or any uh, layer type that we have, but you can also store metadata, legends, relational tables, and other things in the database, which makes it much more uh, flexible and useful. Now, it's not just uh, a database, it's a database with an extension for dealing with uh, spatial objects, uh, like in other objects that you have in a normal database. It adds the additional spatial types for representing uh, geographic features. And the most important thing is the bounding boxes. So we can ask questions to the database, find uh, this within a certain uh, polygon or in a certain area. Like give me all the rivers in Malawi and then it will give that back based on the bounding boxes and the Malawi country map and the river layer. So uh, that's basically what it says here. So what objects are within a particular bounding box? There are several examples of uh, spatial databases. There is uh, PostGIS, and that's an extension to the Postgres database that's completely open source. And that's what is uh, often behind uh, the spatial data infrastructures. There are other databases from Oracle and Esri. And there are also personal databases that you can store as a file on your hard disk like Spatialite and the Geo Package. And we're going to talk a bit, a bit more about the Geo Package. So geo package is becoming more and more uh, the new standard uh, to replace the, the shape file. Uh, therefore, it's also mainstreamed in, uh, in the courses that I give. It is the default format in uh, QGIS uh, 3. And you can create a new geo package there, but you can also write layers to an existing geo package. And in our um, tutorials that we're going to do, we are going to use this format uh, quite a lot. 
and you can save it with this extension dot gpkg so that's the name of the database and within the database you will have your different layers and you can save there the output of different processing tools as you will see in the tutorials but also your styles and here you see a screenshot how to save a style to your geo package and then everybody who uh, opens that layer will get the styling uh, with it which makes it much easier to share uh, the layers You can easily package all the layers of your project into one uh, geo package. That's with uh, the package layers tool. So here you see it happening. An example from the tutorial. So I've selected all the layers and when I run it, they all are packaged into one uh, geo package. So here you see it again, all these uh, five layers. Click OK. I save the layer styles also in the package and I save it. And then all the layers of this project are wrapped into one geo package file, including their styles, which I can easily share with, uh, with other users. Here on the right, you see uh, the tool in uh, the processing toolbox. And a more recent functionality in the, the recent versions of QGIS that you can save your project to a geo package. We also do that in the tutorials. So there's a workflow that I can recommend you. So if you work in QGIS, style your vector layers, then when you're finished with your project, you package all the vector layers to the geo package. Then you drag the rasters to the geo package in the browser panel because this package function only works on the vectors. But if you drag your rasters in the browser panel to the geo package, then they will be automatically uh, imported. Then start a clean new project because the old project still has the links to maybe shape files and other files. So start a clean project and then add the layers from the geo package, which already have the styling, except for the rasters because they are not stored with the styling. Then you style your rasters again, and then you save your whole project to the geo package. And in that way, you have everything in one file that you can share with your colleagues without any problem. There might be still a few bugs in this functionality, but uh, try it at least and uh, you will see that this is a very useful way. So here in QGIS under project in the main menu, you can say save to geo package and then everything will be wrapped into the geo package. The next set of files that I want to discuss are the style files. And a style file describes how raster and vector files are visualized in the GIS application. And it's important that if you have styled layers that you also style, uh, share those styling files uh, with other users to visualize the data in the same way. Here on the right side, you see an example. There's uh, the same data set, boreholes, but uh, the different boreholes are styled with different attributes, so uh, different depths, in the first, uh, in the upper picture, and the fluoride uh, content of the water, concentration of the water is in the lower picture. So with the same layer and different styling, you can visualize different uh, points. Now these different formats are very tricky because uh, they are often uh, not meant to be shared uh, with other software. So uh, the SV format is the dot layer file uh, and it can uh, normally not be opened in QGIS, but there's a new uh, functionality which is paid. So if you have money and you're really relying on this dot uh, LYR files, the layer files, you can use the SLIR tool, the S3 to QGIS compatibility suit, which is developed by uh, Northroad, which develops a lot of uh, open source tools for QGIS, but this one is closed, um, unfortunately uh, for you. And then we have the .qml file. That's the QGIS format. There are many other formats, but I'll just show a few of them. And that is then not supported by ESRI. So you cannot read the .qml files into uh, ArcGIS or ArcMap. So that's tricky. But in both uh, software, you can export to a standard, to an OGC standard for styling. And that's the styled layer descriptor. And it has the file extension .sld. And uh, that is supported by ESRI, by QGIS, and by many other GIS applications, including GeoServer that is behind uh, a lot of the SDIs. 
So a good practice is to, if you don't share it in a geo package, that you share the styling in an SLD file. Then briefly, another topic on the, the web services, because we are going to use that in the, in the tutorials, but uh, you'll probably hear more about that in, uh, in other sessions, uh, not part of, of the, the three that I do. But um, there's the, there are OGC standards for sharing uh, data through web services. And for data, there's the WMS, which is basically a rendered picture in JPEG or PNG format that uh, is uh, live connected to, uh, to an SDI or a geo server or map server. There's the web feature service that is not a rendered picture, but the real vector data. So WFS is the vector data. We're going to use that uh, in the tutorial. And there's the web coverage service, which is the raster. So WFS is vector, WCS is raster data. And you can load that live from your SDI into QGIS. Then there are other standards to share uh, metadata and there are standards to share uh, processing, which is out of the scope of this uh, lecture. What you often also find are tiled web maps. That's a more efficient way of sharing online uh, layers because in the WMS, uh, the picture is basically one big picture of the whole world, uh, which can take a long time to load, especially if you have uh, low bandwidth, which might be uh, the case in your case. Uh, but the tiled web map uh, splits the layer into many different tiles and only loads the ones that are necessary for uh, your uh, extent in your map canvas in, in your GIS. So it's more uh, efficient for online visualization of, uh, of layers. And some examples are uh, Google Maps and you can simply add it uh, with the X, Y, Z tiles in the browser uh, panel or OpenStreetMap. But um, to look up all these uh, URLs uh, can be a bit difficult. So what we use a lot is the Quick Map Services plugin where you can get access to all these different online layers. And uh, most of them are X, Y, Z layers and use these tiles in your uh, QGIS project as a, as a backdrop. But remember, these are pictures that you use as a backdrop and not the real data. Now that was an overview of all the different uh, file types. Um, of course, you can use the GDAL command line or scripts to convert these, but uh, QGIS also comes with a lot of uh, tools for conversion. So you can convert raster formats to other raster formats. You find it under the raster menu you go to conversion and then uh, you go to uh, translate. So you can convert a GeoTIFF to an ASCII grid and vice versa. Factor to factor. So you can do that uh, with the export function, then save features as. We'll do that a lot in the tutorial today. And you can even save only the selected features. We'll also do that. You can rasterize factors. Then there's a factor to raster, you find it here. And there is a polygonize where you can go from raster to vector. You can save a GIS layer into a geodatabase uh, with the package uh, layers plugin, for example, or dragging it from the browser into the geo package. And the geodatabase to a GIS file, that's the other way around. Then again, you can export the features. And you can store web services uh, that you have online to tiles to use them offline. And we will do that uh, tomorrow because we are going to develop an app where we also want to use the Google satellite and the um, OpenStreetMap uh, uh, offline when we don't have an internet connection in the field. And then you can use these tools in the processing toolbox to generate these tiles and uh, use them offline with a certain zoom level. Then there are project files. They are different from the GIS layers and they are very software specific. So they are not meant to exchange uh, between different software. There's the .mxd extension, which is used for uh, ArcMap projects, the .qg, .qgs and the .qgz, which are the QGS project formats. And the newer one is the QGZ that we use nowadays. So if you don't save it into a geo package, then you save it as a separate QGZ file. Very important is that project files, they don't store the data. The data are stored on your disk, but it only stores the path to the layer, so the link. 
and not the layers themselves. So if you only share the MXD from uh, ArcGIS, then uh, you will get errors because it cannot find the layers and the same with the QGIS project files. But it does style the styling. It does save the styling and the zoom level of your map canvas when you saved it and the projection that you use for your project. That's what we call the on the fly projection. Also with the, with the Slayer tool uh, that you can buy, you can convert the ArcMap uh, MXD project to a QGIS format. There's a lot of confusion because this is one of the reasons why people stick to one tool because they think that the data is the same as the project file, but in the MXD ArcMap project, you can have shape files and that you can simply read in other tools. So you're not bound by uh, software because it can only uh, store certain project files because projects are different from the data. So good, pro uh, good practice with project files is that you um, not share uh, in general the project file, but the data with good metadata. Uh, but if you really need to share it, then use this way of including it in a geo package together with all the data in one geo package file and prevent that you get this case. So if you start to move the files around after saving the project and then open the project again, you get this problem. For example, this boundary layer cannot be found in this place. Uh, so you get the handle bad layers error and uh, yeah, avoid that. So don't start moving the things all the time. If you move things, load it again and save your, your project uh, again to avoid this. Then a few uh, final slides on good practice. Never ever save data on your desktop or in my documents, but make a dedicated folder on your hard disk. If you get a new computer, uh, ask the company uh, to uh, make separate partitions, one for your file system, uh, your uh, operating system. Normally that's the C drive where you have your program files and one drive where you can save your data. Uh, for example, the D drive, or in my case, it's the Z drive. If you have those things separate and something goes wrong, then your IT specialists only have to reinstall your C drive and your data uh, stays where it is. Uh, and having dedicated folders for your uh, projects that you work on, on your D drive or Z drive, uh, yeah, it makes things uh, very uh, trackable. If you're gonna mess up everything in my documents, then, uh, then it will be tricky. My documents and desktop also have another problem because they have spaces and they use your profile. So you don't really know where it's going in your file system. So very important and to avoid errors in GIS is don't use spaces and strange characters and accents in folder and file names because a lot of the algorithms that we use will drop errors then. Also keep the file names intuitive. Don't use test one, test two, it's, uh, it's great if you're testing different functionality, but just give it a name that you understand what, understood what you did in that step. Otherwise, uh, the next day you don't know anymore was test two that I did the reprojection to that format or otherwise, and, and keep the names uh, short. Learn where your browser saves the downloaded files. You can change the setting in your browser to always ask where to save it. I, I use that setting because I don't want to save everything to downloads. If I have project documents, I want to directly save that into the project folder. So avoid mess a mess on your computer and a full desktop with files. And learn how to use zip files, a very important skill. Recognize when things are zipped because they will give errors if you are a bit further in your processing. And zip files can contain files that are zipped, but also folders. And if you unzip the folder and you already made a folder, then you have that folder twice. It's a common problem. So get used to how to you work with zip files. Some examples. This is an incorrect way to store your file. There are several problems here. First of all, if you have a D drive, don't save it on C where your program files are. It has a space, which gives errors in some tools. It has a minus, use an underscore. So never use the minus, use the underscore. So a correct, correct way to save this uh, geotiff is to use dgis underscore core slash dm.tiff. Yeah, another example, same problem. We have a space here, but we also have a dot in the folder name, which is not, it looks like a file extension. So very confusing to do it like this and it probably will give errors. So replace these with underscores. 
and think about how to organize for a project your files. So make subfolders for slides, for exercises, and then subfolder for each exercise. So you can do the same for these tutorials uh, or follow my uh, good practice advice in the tutorials. And this is a strange last slide. And this boils down to the, the most important good practice uh, message that I want to give you is the metadata. So here you see four uh, bottles of beer and uh, probably in your countries, you also like to drink uh, beers and maybe you have a favorite beer and you go to the bar and uh, you ask for that favorite beer. Um, here in the, in the Netherlands, you, uh, well, let, let's take, uh, take Belgium. We have uh, Arno here. Uh, maybe uh, you want a La Chouf and you ask uh, the bartender for the, the La Chouf beer and he gives you a bottle without a label. And you drink it and you think, well, this might be La Chouf, but it could also be something else. But it tastes good. So you, you ask another La Chouf and maybe uh, you will see the, the bottle uh, label. But then again, you get a bottle without a label. And I can make sure after five beers, it doesn't matter anymore what the label was. So there's something wrong there. Here you see some of my colleagues in, in Kenya drinking the Tusker beer. And um, as you can see, the bottle has a label and the label gives you the expiry date. It gives you the content of alcohol. It gives you the amount of uh, milliliters or centiliters that are in the bottle. It gives you some advice not to drink when you're pregnant, not to drive uh, with alcohol. Um, and the address of the company, the brewer that, that produced uh, the bottle. Based on that information, these people um, think it is uh, okay to drink it at that nice moment in the national park. So this is the good practice. And now the link with data, you need this metadata to provide it with others so they know that this is the data that they need. If you don't provide the metadata, then uh, you run into problems. So in QGIS, you can provide the metadata uh, also uh, uh, through a tool, but you can also just simply make a text file which describes what the data is.